Is this working? Is it too loud or is it okay? That's fine, cool. Yes. Yeah. Uh, no comment. Yes. Maybe. Okay, I think we can get started. Um, happy Friday, thank you all for showing up. I know it's like Friday noon, you didn't have to be here, so I appreciate you coming to learn about clustering algorithms, woohoo! And um, today you have a very special guest lecturer. He has no published papers, um, no academic awards. His only job is being a TA, and that's myself um, for this class, so. <laughs> thank you. Um, I'll do my best today. Um, we're gonna talk, we're gonna jump right in. Um, so for today's lecture, we're gonna be continuing our dive into unsupervised learning. Um, so this past week we've been focusing on it and it is focused on finding patterns in data without associated labels. Um, so in the past, like when we looked at like linear regression, SVMs, we have data that is like our, our vectors X and then also the labels Y and now our data doesn't have any labels and we're just trying to explore the data and try to get a better sense of what it's like. So for the past couple of lectures, we've been talking about dimensionality reduction, talking about PCA and how we can use that to discern like the most important directions in our data. And today we're gonna look in a different direction and take a look at clustering, um, which is about finding patterns in the data and finding like which su subsets of the data are similar. So let's get a high level idea of clustering. Um, the objective in clustering is to assign each data point to a cluster. Um, and there are many applications of clustering. So one application is just like trying to explore data and categorize subsets like I talked about before. In the real world, this could be used, for instance, to categorize consumer behavior based on like spending habits. And then another really cool application of clustering is outlier detection. You can make your respective clusters and then the points that fall outside of those clusters can be counted as outliers. Um, my first project in machine learning was actually an outlier detection using clustering project. Um, I used, I took data from like mouse movement and clicks on, on the web to identify like bots on like a certain website and you can use clustering to figure out like what, what behaviors are like behaviors that bots use. So I think that's really cool. And then um, the, main, the main question that we want to answer today about clustering is what makes a good cluster? Um, and I would like to think that there are two really important um, features of a good clustering algorithm. Um, we want high intra-cluster similarity. That means that all the points that are inside of one cluster are very similar to each other. And then we also want low inter-cluster similarity, which means that all of the points that are in different clusters are not similar to each other. So 
here's a diagram that maybe shows this pretty well. Um, we want to like maximize intercluster distances and minimize intracluster distances. Um, and based on like these two properties, it seems that similarity is like the most important um, part of making a good clustering algorithm. But similarity is kind of a vague term, um, so we want to define that. And one way we can define similarity is with a distance metric. We can, it's really important to try to convert like our words and our ideas into mathematical notions. And so for, in the clustering case, we want points to be similar or dissimilar, and that is equal in mathematics to wanting the distance to be maximized or minimized. So now we've kind of formalized this idea of similarity. Um, any questions so far about clustering? Okay, awesome. So now let's talk a little bit more about a distance metric. Um, I'm sure that you all have dealt with distance metrics in past math classes or computer science classes or data science classes. Um, I just wanted to define a few of the properties that make a distance metric a distance metric. So first of all, equivalence. Um, two points J and K are equivalent if and only if the distance between the two is zero. So like if we have a vector of two points, like the distance be between those two points, if it's zero, then they must be the same point. That makes sense. Um, symmetry. If we calculate the distance between J and K, that should be the distance between K and J, right? Distance should not be based on like the order of the two terms. And finally, the, tr the triangle inequality is really important to define a distance metric. Um, if we have three points, I, J, and K, the distance between I and J plus the distance between J and K should be greater than the distance between I and K. And that, um, that comes from the idea that like, you know, the distance between two points should be like, as like should be minimal as possible. So the most common example of distance that we see every day is Euclidean distance, um, and that's like the L2 stuff that we have seen in past classes. And there's also Manhattan distance, which is L1. We saw that when we were dealing with lasso regression. So these are ideas of like distance metrics. So now let's talk about a specific clustering algorithm called k-means clustering. Um, in k-means clustering, each cluster is represented by a centroid, so a centroid is like the center of the cluster, and each data point is assigned to a cluster. Um, the goal for k-means clustering is to find the best centroids that minimize the distance between the centroid and the data points assigned to its cluster. So I talked a little bit before about how a good clustering algorithm should have like high intra-cluster similarity and low inter-cluster similarity. So k-means clustering is really focused on that intra-cluster similarity. It wants the the points in the cluster to be as similar as possible. Um, the objective function for this, we use the distance metric that we were talking about before. In this case, it's Euc the squared Euclidean distance. And this is basically saying that we want to minimize the distance between the centroid and all of the points that are assigned to the centroid. So you see that um, the inner summation has x in, in s sub k. s sub k is the subset of points that are assigned to the cluster. So all of those points that are assigned to the cluster, we calculate the distances for those, and we want to minimize that for all of the clusters. Um, any questions about the objective function? Okay. So let's talk about optimizing the objective function. I think the really nice part about the k-means clustering algorithm is that it's not like it's not super mathematically granular. We're not using gradients or anything. It's actually like really intuitive um, once you get to see an example. Um, so I will first define the algorithm and then we'll walk through an example so that you can kind of see how it works. So the first part of the k-means clustering algorithm is that we initialize our k cluster centroid. It's called k-means clustering because we have k clusters. Um, so we assign, we initialize those randomly. So they are random points on our coordinate space. And then we repeat the following two points until we get really good clusters. Um, for every single data point in our data set, we want to assign it a cluster label, zi, that minimizes the distance between the data point and the cluster. So basically pick the cluster that is closest to the data point that we're looking at and make that like its cluster label as for now. And then once we have all of those cluster labels, we want to adjust our clusters. So we set the cluster to the, the mean of all the data points that are assigned to it. So this indicator variable, the one, and then in brackets it has like zi is equal to ck, that is just that is just to filter out all of the data points that are assigned to that specific cluster. 
And then once we filter out all those data points, we take the mean of like the data. So I'll walk through an example, and hopefully it'll become more clear. So we start with data points like this, and we want to clusterize, cluster them. So right now they are all like same points. We initialize two random cluster centroids. And let's say the random initialization puts them um, in those two spaces. Ev can everyone see that, by the way? Okay, awesome. Now, the second part of the k-means algorithm is that we need to assign all the data points to clusters. So, in this step we do that, we can see that like all of the points that are labeled in red now are the ones that are closest to the cluster, that the x cluster that is red, and then all the blue points are closest to like the blue cluster centroid. And now we want to recalibrate the clusters. So now we are moving the cluster centroids, and we have moved them so that they are like in the middle of all of the points um, that are assigned to them. And then we repeat this process. So once again, we allocate data points to the clusters. So now you see that the allocation kind of shifts, but that's good because that means our model is converging a little bit more. And then we repeat the process where we adjust the centroids. Yes. Oh, um, not, not really. So we, our data doesn't have any data points. We are basically giving it labels on our own. Like those, those labels don't mean anything in the moment. We're just trying to like categorize the data as best we can. But it's not like we're like gonna make predictions with those and say like, I guess, I guess what I'm trying to say is the, when we make a prediction, like with classification for instance, like let's say we're trying to classify between like 10 classes. Like, and the output of our prediction will be like zero, one, two, three, et cetera. When we, when we assign a data point to a cluster, the number of that cluster doesn't mean anything. It doesn't matter if it's cluster one, two, three, four, like that's not gonna help us make a prediction. That's just telling us that the data point, this data point is similar to all those points in the cluster. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, so that's the, so from here to here, we want to actually reassign all of the data points. It's just that like the ones that you see that were blue and now turned red are the ones that like shifted, but all of the data points are being like reassigned. Cool. Any other questions on like this example for k-means or the general algorithm? Awesome. So I think a lot of people get k-means clustering and k-nearest neighbors confused because they are both algorithms that start with k. And um, <laughs> so I, I was confused by this when I first learned about them, so I'm trying, I would like to clarify it for everybody. So for k-means, our objective is to just find patterns in data. And for k-nearest neighbors, we're trying to predict the label of a test point. So these labels actually have meaning. Like they're, like it means that like a data point is like a dog or a cat or something. Like in k-means, we don't necessarily know what there are no labels, so we don't necessarily know like what the data is representing, um, but we're trying to find that representation. And so the data that we're given for k-means is just like all of the all of our x data points. Um, with k nearest neighbors, we actually have like those labels y. And then the training algorithm for k-means we just talked about it is like moving clusters to be the mean of its assigned points, and then continuing that process. Um, k nearest neighbors, we don't have we don't have any training algorithm. We just pl plot all the points down and then we use the points to make some predictions on new test points. So when given a test point for k-nearest neighbors, we compare the point to its k-nearest neighbors and then make a prediction based on like its majority or its mean, like the majority or mean labels. And then for k-means, we want to compare the data point to the k-centroids. So in k-nearest neighbors, there are like no centroids at all, um, so like that's an important idea. So now let's talk about tuning the k-means algorithm. Um, like k-means can work really well, but it needs to be tuned very carefully. Um, the, the most important question to ask and the most common one is like, how do we know how many clusters k we should have? Uh, with my previous like example, I assumed that like k is equal to two, but could we get a better clustering set if we had like three clusters or five clusters or so on? How do we, how do we know how many clusters we should have? And 
There's something called the elbow heuristic for k-means and also a lot of other algorithms, um, which works really well. Basically, we want to plot the k-means loss function for various k for various k-means models with like different numbers of clusters, and then we pick the best k so that increasing k leads to like a really small decrease in the loss. And it's called the elbow theorem because or the elbow like heuristic because you can see that for like most of the time, and we see this like we see this in the real world, there's like a steep drop off that kind of looks like an elbow, um, where like the loss doesn't really decrease that much. And then we usually just pick um, the value of k based on like that elbow inflection right there. And then another way that we can tune the k-means algorithm is the centroid initialization part. So much of the focus in the example was like showing how the centroids move around and how we assign points. But where we initialize the centroids is equally as important. Um, for instance, what happens if a centroid is initialized so far away that all the data points get assigned to no points? In that case, if we ha we're supposed to have five clusters, but one of the centroids was initialized super badly, we're basically stuck with like four clusters, which is not what we wanted, right? So a question is like, can we improve our model um, with like better initialization techniques? Um, because we're using random initialization right now, k-means is likely to converge to like a local minima. Um, we talked about how the k-means algorithm, it's going to converge. Um, the question is like, what is it gonna converge to? Um, most of the time it's gonna be a local minima rather than like the global minima of our loss function. Um, so to get the best results, it is good to run like k-means multiple times and then just pick the one that yields the best loss. So this is kind of a way to tune your parameters. Any questions about tuning the k-means algorithm? Okay, awesome. Um, now I'm gonna talk about a better way to initialize the centroids in the beginning, which is called k-means plus plus. Um, this like plus plus idea is really popular in computer science, I guess, because a lot of people use it. Um, but k-means plus plus is not like a brand new algorithm for k-means clustering by any means. It's um, just an initialization scheme to improve the cluster quality. So the idea is, first of all, we randomly select the first centroid from the data points. So instead of like randomly initializing the centroids like anywhere on our coordinate space, we pick one of the data points specifically and that's gonna be our centroid. And then for every single data point, we want to compute the distance between like that data point and then the centroids. And then we will use those distances to create a probability distribution. So kind of like what we saw in like softmax before, like we will use some function and then some function and then like weight it in order to like assign a probability distribution. So we select any data point to be the next centroid with probability, like the distance of it squared divided by the sum, the sum of all the squared distances. And I will show you an example of this like later. Um, so hopefully that will make things more clear. Um, the, the key idea here is that we want to calculate the distances and then the square distance is gonna be our, like the square distance is gonna be our metric to weigh different points. So if a number is like, if a data point is really far away, then its probability is gonna be higher, right? Because its square distance is higher relative to like the sum of all the square distances. So the probability of picking that like farther away point is higher than if we pick a really close point. And as a result, we will hopefully get centroids that are initialized like really far away from each other and can generate good clusters. So we will repeat this process until all k centroids have been sampled, and then we'll start our convergence algorithm. So here's an example of this. So we randomly select a data point from all of our data points um, to be the first centroid, and then now we want to select the next centroid. So we compute the distance from all of these different points, um, and then we like create that probability distribution, and then we sample a new centroid point, and now we have the new one in red that's like way down at the bottom, and this occurs with pretty high likelihood because it's like very far away from the data point that we had before. Um, it's not, I want to make it clear, it's not deterministic that this point will be like the next centroid just because the farthest away. It could have been like, it could have been any of the points surrounding it because they all have like pretty high probability distribution. It could be like a point that's really close to it. But the idea with k-means plus plus is that it's most likely to um, initialize a centroid that's farther away and this idea of randomness is good because at the end of the day, like 
if we have some randomness, we can use those random initializations multiple times to like to pick a best initialization to get a good local minima regardless. So if we made it deterministic, I don't think the algorithm would work as well. So looking at the third centroid, um, we, we repeat the same process where we calculate the distances, and then like in this case, it picked like this red data point as the data point that will be like the next centroid. Um, another clarification that I want to make is that just because these data points are initialized as a centroid doesn't mean that at the end of like the k-means algorithm, the clusters, like the cluster centroids will be data points. This is just like a random initialization. So once we move around, like the centroids may not be data points. They may just be like random points on our coordinate space, but they started off in the right place and hopefully that gives us a good clustering. Any questions on team? Yes. I don't think you need to. Mm -hmm. It's like the red point right here. Oh, yeah, it does. I think so. Um, because you want, like, I don't believe it should. I will check on that, like, later. Um, the reason why is because, like, if we factored in this, like, red point, then it would be possible to pick this centroid again, right? And we don't want that. Now I want to shift gears a little bit. Um, we finished talking about k-means clustering and like how to tune the algorithm. Hopefully that makes sense. Now I want to talk about mixture of Gaussian models, which are another clustering algorithm. This one is a little bit more probability rigorous, so I will try to break it down like as best I can. But also we won't be testing you super thoroughly on this. We just want you to understand the concept of mixture of Gaussian models so that you know they exist because they're still pretty relevant today. Um, K-means is probably the most popular clustering algorithm, I think, because it works well and it's simple. But if you want a more robust, um, if you want a more robust clustering algorithm, mixture of Gaussians is a really good alternative. So let's break that down. So, unlike K-means, mixture of Gaussian models are probabilistic. So we will be seeing more math in this part. Um, that I remember in like LDA, like Gaussian discriminant analysis, we tried to like model different. We tried to like mo model different point classes with Gaussians. In mixture of Gaussian models, we do the same. Um, we believe that every data point x is drawn from one of k Gaussians with a unique mean and variance. And already, you can kind of see that mixture of Gaussian models have some difference from k-means. Like in k-means, all the clusters they have the same properties, right? Like because because clusters exhibit some symmetry, but with mixture of Gaussian models all of the Gaussians that we initialize our clusters to can like be pretty different because they can have different covariances. So in like homework we saw that like we saw that the covariance determines like the shape, like whether it's more spherical or like more long and elliptical. And we can see that in mixture of Gaussians. Um, the difficult thing about mixture of Gaussians is that there's like a prior on the probability that the Gaussian will be picked. So there's two steps here. The first is like we pick which Gaussian will be used to sample the data point x, and then we sample the data point x from the Gaussian. So for each Gaussian, like the probability that it will be used to model x i, like a data point x i, um, is a mono is a multinomial distribution. So multinomial distribution is like it's like binomial distribution, but um, it is like it is expanded upon rather than like instead of having two classes, you can have like k number of classes. So the challenge here is that we don't know what this like phi, this phi parameter that defines the multinomial distribution is. So there's like a lot of unknowns in mixture of Gaussian models that we are trying to like estimate. Um, and so phi is one of them, and then all of the means of the, all the means of the Gaussians are one or the other, and then finally there's like the covariances of all the Gaussians. So those are the three parameters that we are trying to optimize for with mixture of Gaussian models. So. In order to classify a data point under a Gaussian distribution, we need to know the probability of the prior, like what is, wh what Gaussian are we going to pick? And then 
probability of xi given zi is the Gaussian distribution that we're talking about. Now given like the Gaussian that we're gonna pick, what is the x value that we're gonna sample? Are we on time? One, two, three. Okay, in other words, um, so we're now modeling like a joint distribution. Because I talked about before, like we don't know what z is, we need to model like x and z in our probability distribution. So we are modeling the joint of x i and z i, and we can use like the conditional, the conditional definition of and to try to break down the joint. So we have probability of x i comma z i is equal to the probability of x given z times the probability of z. And so, yes, that is like the, that's the prior on which Gaussian we're gonna pick. So, I can rewind a little bit. So, in this slide we talked about how like, each data point is drawn from K Gaussians, kind of like in GD, kind of like in Gaussian discriminant analysis, like we classified, we have class of Gaussians to model points. Um, but in mixture of Gaussians, there's a chance, there's like a prior on which Gaussian we're gonna pick. So with like probability point two, we will pick like the first Gaussian to model X. With probability like point three, we will pick the second Gaussian to model point. So that's what Z is. And each, each data point has like a different Z. Yes. Yeah, exactly. That's a good way to think about it. So our optimization objective in this case um, we will be going, we go back to like log likelihoods in mixture of Gaussian, so we're trying to maximize the log likelihood. So we are trying to maximize the log likelihood of the probability of the joint, which is probability of x, i, and z, i, and then we can break that down into like the, into the product that we see below, which is probability of x, i given z, i times probability of z, i. And we want to sum over like all the different labels for z, i. So for a mixture of Gaussian models, we optimize them using a technique called expectation maximization. Um, you can think of expectation maximization as similar to like gradient descent. Gradient descent is our optimization technique in like neural networks and like we used it for logistic regression for instance. Um, in mixture of Gaussian models, we will use expectation maximization. There's actually a way to use gradient descent with mixture of Gaussian models, but the most popular way is DNM. Um, it's out of scope. so. Um, you don't have to like worry about it too much, but we want you to know that it exists. Um, I think that's pretty important. So what are the benefits of mixture of Gaussian models? Um, I mean, we just talked about why k-means is really good already, so like, what does mixture of Gaussian models give us instead? Um, mixture of Gaussian models allow us to learn di different covariances per cluster. Um, in k-means, every cluster has the same properties. If you run a k-means algorithm, a lot of the times you will see that each cluster exhibits like a spherical geometric shape. So if this, so if data points are like spherical, it'll exhibit like spherical like data points, um, clusters. But if the data set is like more elliptical, k-means clustering will not model that as well. However, mixture of Gaussians, because it has different covariance matrix, you're able to like model like longer like elliptical data clusters really, really well. Um, Mixture of Gaussians also makes like explicit assumptions in the form of statistical distributions. We like math in this class. Um, it makes <laughs> it makes modeling um, good for like modeling uncertainty, and it also makes the algorithm more robust. So we're able to do more things and like tweak more parameters with mixture of Gaussian models. Um, I have an example here, and then I just wanted to show this diagram before we go to the example. Um, so here you see like the original data. If we clustered it perfectly, it would look something like this. With k-means, we can cluster it like this. And with expectation maximization, mixture of Gaussians, we get like this type of clustering. Note that like this big green cluster right here, it's kind of elliptical in shape. But then with ENM, or, but with k-means, it becomes like more spherical. So this is a limitation of k-means algorithm. Um, it tends to make more spherical clusters. Whereas like with mixture of Gaussians, because we can model the covariance matrix differently, we can actually get this cluster that's more elliptical and is more accurate to the actual data set cluster. Um, assuming perfect clusters, like a lot of times like there's no like perfect like data labels like this. Um, any questions about mixture of Gaussian models? Yes.
Yeah, that's a good question. I think it is definitely really helpful to feature, like, to featureize your data even more and make to make better clusters. So, like, you can use like a polynom like polynomial featureization, for instance. Um, I'm not sure about kernelization for clustering algorithms. The reason why is because, like, in k-means, for instance, it, we're not taking like dot products between two between two data points, and so like kernelization specifically, like the kernel trick, is used to bypass or is used to like improve the runtime of dot products between like featureized vectors. Does that answer the question? Um, you would, you would, for polynomial features, for instance, you would um, do them like in a brute force way. So if you had like three features, x1, x2, and x3, you would just manually compute x1 squared, x2 squared, x3 squared, x1 times x2, so on. Yeah, I would say that like k-means isn't a very difficult model to train. So like it doesn't take too long. So if you have like a larger feature, if you have a, uh, if you have data points with many features, it won't, it won't cause too many problems. I think, for like making the training runtime long. Um, what else was I gonna say? Yeah, I think that's good. We can turn, so we can turn to um, this example, and then I think we we can end our day. That's good uh, for anime Rick. Um, so yeah, that's the end of today's lecture. Um, we were finishing off a little bit early, but I'll stick around for questions. Um, thank you all for coming. I appreciate having you today. Yeah, enjoy your Friday. <laughs>